Good morning and welcome to Smoky Hill Vineyard Church. Whether you're here in person or joining SHV at home, we're so glad to be able to experience God's presence together. My name is Joan and I'm the pastor of Community Life. My name is Stephanie and I'm on staff at SHV too. If you are new to SHV and just checking things out today, we are so glad to have you. Today, we'll start with our service with a collective prayer for the people of Afghanistan and Haiti. Please join together following the words on the screen as we lift up our precious brothers and sisters before God. Um, so the words will be on the screen. And if you're not aware of those situations, just um, Haiti has gone through so much and um, has just recently had both um, their president assassinated and then just had an earthquake again this past week. So we wanna pray for uh, people there and then in Afghanistan, um, all the people of that country and especially um, followers of Jesus who are facing uh, persecution once again. So um, the words will be on the screen and let's bring up that prayer. So I'll read a part and then we'll all join together. Father God, we lift to you the people of Haiti, suffering through earthquake, poverty, and government instability. Lord, show mercy. We pray for those working with Convoy of Hope in Haiti. Protect them and multiply their efforts to bring food and medical help. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father God, we lift to you the people of, of Afghanistan suffering through the takeover of their country by the Taliban. Lord, Lord show, show mercy. mercy. We pray for all those who are fleeing. May they find shelter and safety and provision for all of their needs. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for all those who follow Jesus in Afghanistan. God, would you give them your courage and peace as they stand for their faith? Would you comfort them in fear and encourage their faith? Lord, show, Lord, show your, your faithfulness, faithfulness to your, your people. people. Father God, remind us here in our comfort and privilege to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who suffer for your name. Lord, Lord soften our hearts. hearts. Lord, Lord, show, show your, your mercy. Lord, Lord, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let's worship together.
help us to see you again for the first time, for the millionth time, and where worship might have just become a routine, I pray that you would help us to engage differently today, that we would press in. It's such a privilege, God, that we don't have to beg to come near you, that you come close to us. I pray that you would help us today to not take that for granted, but to come close to you.
guarantee you that every person has some place in their lives where they're aching for God to move. Maybe it's someone that you love who doesn't know Jesus yet. Maybe you yourself feel distant from God. Maybe you're ready to receive more gifts of the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, invite the Lord to come, to come in those places of aching and longing and give you more of himself. or effort that transforms our hearts, but it's the power of your spirit as we follow you and say yes to you. So we ask that uh, you would continue your transforming work, God, in all the ways that we notice it and in the ways we haven't yet. We invite you in. Amen and amen. If you're here in the room, before you sit down, take a minute to say hello to someone. You could pass the peace, saying grace and peace be with you, and they can say back and also with you. If you're online, uh, please take a moment to send a text to someone who may need some encouragement today. You can bless them with grace and peace as well. had a chance to enjoy some of the summer hangouts that have been going on in July and August. Starting in a few weeks, we have a number of different small groups starting up, and these are the best way to get connected with each other and to grow in your faith. That's right, and we have groups on almost every day of the week, some that have a particular interest and others are more like weekly hangouts. I would love to see you get connected. Come and talk with me after service or send me an email and I'd love to help you out. You can find all the details on our website, This Week at SHV page, and on our app. And if you're here in person, we also have a flyer with all the group info that you can take home. Also, SHV Youth is going strong and is gearing up for our next event. If you're a middle or high school student, join us for a night of s'mores and outdoor movie. Check out our events page for details and be sure to text SHV Youth to 97000 to receive regular updates. Maybe you are like our family and stepping back into a normal school year rhythm. How is your rhythm with God? If you need a helpful tool for prayers and scripture, check out the daily prayer guide on the SHV app. Every day has a simple collection of prayers and scripture verses to help you in your life with Jesus. 
Before Christy comes up to preach today, let's take time to thank God for taking care of us and by giving our tithes and offerings. Thank you for giving here or online. Your support means that right now we're able to help in Haiti because of our financial commitment to Convoy of Hope. May God continue to bless you as you bless others. Hello, Smoky Hill Vineyard. How is everyone? Great. I got some really excited, like, ooh, we made it through first little bit of school. Is that what some of you are feeling? <laughs> That's what we're feeling. I sound like Kermit, so I apologize. I think I got like a little kid ear infection from my kids going back to school or something. I don't know. So if you'll just uh, bear with me. I apologize, but maybe later I'll sing and I'll sound like Barry White or something. So <laughs> just kidding. Nobody wants to hear that. So, <laughs> all right. Have you guys been enjoying this series on life by the Spirit? Has it been good? Has it been life-giving for you? I have loved, I, I always find it really um, impactful for me personally when I hear other stories. It just takes the scripture, brings it to life, and just sets it in my heart in a way that um, I just find really life-giving. So I hope you guys have enjoyed that. And I was thinking this week about all of these, the fruit that we have been thinking about and all the ways that we would maybe describe ourselves, right? And I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't call myself someone who was full of hatred and despair and anxiety and rash decisions and a lack of self-control and rude and vile and disloyal, right? I started thinking about all of the things that would be like the antithesis of the fruit of the Spirit of God. And I thought, well, probably, maybe it's just me, I would think most of us would be far more comfortable saying, oh, I'm full of love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control, right? Gentleness, all, I'm, gentleness. Super gentle, you can ask my husband. I never am competitive at all. And uh, so last week, Noel did a great job of reminding us that with gentle restoration, all of those, the, the presence of the fruit, we get to be a part of family business sometimes. And sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? But it's also really life-giving. So today we're going to move further into Galatians 6, and we're going to talk about how all of the presence of all of the fruit of the Spirit allows us then to live that fruit out in our lives in a way that is tangible, changing, maybe it does actually grow gentleness or whatever it is in you, and that to have those healthy family relationships in the body of Christ, we have to do some hard work sometimes, don't we? Yeah, amen. I like the two that are shaking your head, so thank you. So we're going to get some life hacks tonight out of um, Galatians and talk about how do we live together? What does it look like to be in the fruit of the Spirit together in the body of Christ? Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this chance to gather together. Lord, it's weeks like these that we are so humbled by the freedom that we have. The freedom to say yes to you, to stand with one another, God. I pray as we gather that you would be glorified tonight, Lord, that you would spark our hearts, that you would continue to grow the fruit inside of us, Lord, that we might, we might just bear the things of your spirit in our families, in our church, in our communities, in our schools. Lord, dwell with us this evening. May you be edified in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to take a minute tonight to introduce you to a young boy named Hal. Okay. And Hal, I've got a picture of his family. He was the oldest of three boys, and they were pastor's kids. So, of course, I have a real affinity for them, right? They grew up outside of the San Francisco area, and when Hal was, he's the, the middle one there, the oldest, and when he was 12 years old, his parents had to go to a church business meeting, which for pastors happens quite often. And so they were, the babysitter was late, so they piled all the kids in the car and, you know, like peeled out of the driveway, and then they saw the babysitter in the rearview mirror. So they ran back, and they dropped the kids because they thought it'd be better to be late than bring these three ramb rambunctious boys to a, a church business meeting, and they, off they went. So that August evening, later that evening, two police show up at the door as the babysitter opens the door. And the officers come in and in a very serious manner sit the boys down and begin to explain that their parents had been hit head-on in a car accident with a drunk driver, and that their father had been killed instantly, and that their mother was fighting for her life in the ICU. 
And you can imagine what that, well, I, I can't imagine actually, but the, the, how overwhelming and grief-filled and shocking that must have been. And of course, the neighbors begin to gather as they hear the commotion, they see the police. And so the officers come outside with the boys on their front yard, their lawn. And one of the officers says, will any of you take these boys? Because if you don't, they're going to end up at the police station overnight with us. And I'm sure all the neighbors, I mean, just imagine what these poor kids must have been experiencing in that moment of, of grief and desperation and feeling really, really alone, right? And this family, the Davises, said yes. Okay, so we'll get into their story, but if you'll turn with me to Galatians 6, this story of Hal's life is one that strikes me to the core as a mom, but also brings the scripture to life in a way that I just go, Lord, help me to say yes. So Galatians 6, 2 through 5, we're going to read through, and then we'll go back through each verse as we consider um, Hal's journey. So those who live by the Spirit, this is what we're reminded of in 6, 1. Those who live by the Spirit carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. So what does it mean to live in the family of Christ with the fruit of the Spirit on display? For me, it's this young couple, the Davises, who was standing there in the front yard said, we're not going to let these boys go to the police station tonight, not knowing if their mom is going to make it, knowing that their dad is never coming home. This family had four of their own children, and they lived in a small trailer, a mobile home. And they said, yes, come. And this one-night sleepover turned into many months as Hal's mother recovered in the hospital and from a very, very desperate place, um, did begin her recovery process. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Sometimes, messages like last week are a little easier when we can go, it's much easier just to bring someone back from sin. <laughs> Not really. But sometimes when we're called to carry burdens, like this is heavy stuff, right? Right? Matthew Henry's commentary on this section of Scripture says, We're to bear one another's burdens, so we shall fulfill the law of Christ. This obliges to mutual forbearance and compassion toward each other, agreeably to Christ's example. It becomes us to bear one another's burdens as fellow travelers. So life, this uprooted life for Hal and his brothers in this small trailer with a new family, there weren't enough beds for the 10 of them, and so they would take turns sleeping on the floor at night. The father, Bill, worked extra hours at the quarry so that he would have enough money to put food in each of their mouths. The mother is said to have cooked, spent her days cooking, cleaning, and laundry, as you can imagine, for 10 people. And as I was processing and thinking about this story, Hal's life, it reminded me and the scripture of Romans 12, 15 that, of course, we're familiar, most of us, with the rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, right? But the whole of that scripture is share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So Hal's mom, her recovery was a slow one. She did begin to learn to walk again. She was eventually released from the hospital and was able to find a job um, as a mail clerk and, and to rent a place for their family. But there had been no health insurance, and so the family was buried in monumental medical debt, as you can imagine. Hal tells stories of remembering walking, being at school with holes in his shoes, and being just teased mercilessly for where he was and the poverty that his family lived in. And the family that he lived with continued to speak truth into these boys' lives. 
The father said, don't allow the tragedy of your childhood to become a lifelong excuse because where you start in life doesn't have to dictate where you end. Hal's life is marked by one fighting to overcome poverty as he experienced the family of Christ coming alongside, meeting his needs, carrying this burden with him, his brothers, his mom. But he fought to free himself from the burden of poverty. He studied hard. He graduated with a bachelor's degree um, from San Jose State in journalism and looked forward to a life of travel and reporting. He really loved sports and had his sights on getting to pair his passion of sports with writing and probably imagine going lots of professional places, which would be fun. But his journey took him to India. He was ghostwriting a book for a couple who was working to feed hungry children in need in Calcutta, India. And while he was there, the couple said, hey, we'd like to introduce you to someone who's been really helpful in our ministry and what we're doing to feed these kids. And as you might guess, that someone was Mother Teresa, right? So at 23 years of age, fresh out of college, the world's his oyster. He has worked his way out of the desperation. He gets a chance to meet and interview Mother Teresa. You guys ever play those games like who would you meet if you could? Like she's always one of the top on my list. I, mean, I just think everything I've ever read about her, she just was fearless to go wherever God sent and I love that she was a woman who would reach across any, any obstacle, any bridge, reach her hand out to anyone, not just to care for them, but to receive in the name of Jesus to then be able to give. I love Mother Teresa. So this is what Hal says about this Roman Catholic saint that he got to interview. He said she was so humble. She wasn't wearing shoes. Her ankles were very swollen. She sat down with me, and she was very polite. And I thought, what a beautiful picture of the humanity and the saintliness at once, right? So after their interview, Mother Teresa, they're all finished, she had a question to pose to Hal. And she said, Hal, what are you doing to help the poor? Hal says it wasn't accusative. She was just asking a simple and fair question. He told her the truth. He said, I'm not doing much. I just got my, his degree in journalism, and he said, I, I really am not focused on helping others. And with a smile on her face, Mother Teresa said, everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. This encounter in India changed how forever. That simple question caused him to face some harsh realities in his own life. He had to come face to face with perhaps the fact that he matched a little bit of Galatians 6.3. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. And then, of course, as we continue in Galatians 6, 4, and 5, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without complaining, I'm sorry, comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. And this is hard, right? It's really easy to go, yes, of course we should carry one another's burdens. Yes, we shouldn't compare ourselves, right? But have you ever done a word study of compare or comparison or compared in the Bible, I, it's not one I would typically necessarily do, but I did for this, this week, and I, do you know how many times God cares about us comparing to others? Well, I could find one in John 21. There's probably some more I just didn't come across. But when one of the disciples says of the other, but Lord, what about him? What's, what's gonna happen with him, right? He's comparing what the Lord has just done in his own life to say, but what about that one? Do you remember what God says? Jesus says what? Don't worry about that. What is it to you? You focus on me. That's the only place I could find between disciples because everything else that I could find, I'm not, you know, I didn't look, read every scripture, so I will say there's potential, there's more out there. But everyone that I found talks about the comparison of God because no one can compare, right? And so I was thinking about how our culture is so seated in this place of, Oh, if we just had this, if I just had this, if I'm watching them, and oh man, I mean, our marketing, our television, our everything 
if I just had that Tesla, or if I just had the shoes without holes, or if I just had whatever it might be, maybe food security for the next day. Whatever that is that you find, maybe it's in your own spiritual journey, and you go, gosh, I love the way that person prays. I remember being incredibly disillusioned when I came to find out that someone who kind of boasted of themselves quite often in their prayer life and the way they were with the Lord on our behalf actually was really, really not a great witness for Christ. And it broke me because for too long I had looked and gone, gosh, I I want to be like that, right? Here's a quote from Hal. He said, I went through a period where I was self-centered. I was just trying to claw my own way out of insignificance. The problem is in trying to escape that life, it's easy to neglect others along the way. I was the guy that would see a homeless person on the, and cross the street so I didn't have to confront him. My focus was climbing to the top instead of helping those trying to climb with me. And like I said, this experience in India changed him, and he began to investigate what was it like for these people living in poverty today. Not his understanding of it when he was a child, but like today, what is this like? And with God's leading, he went to eight different urban cities and lived on the streets for three days in each city, Atlanta, Chicago, some some rough streets. And he spent three days getting to know the prostitutes and the drug dealers and the homeless and the destitute in each of those cities. And he allowed the Lord to begin to work on his heart once he learned their stories and began to carry their burdens. So he went home after that experience and he he withdrew, I think it was the $300 that he had in his account and filled up a truck with food and went to begin meeting needs for those who were in those same situations. Now, some of you may not recognize this story, but have you ever heard of the organization called Convoy of Hope? Okay, so Hal is the president and CEO of Convoy of Hope, Hal Donaldson. And I don't know how much you know about Convoy. SHV has been a partner with Convoy for quite some time. I was thinking about actually, I I think like when my daughter was a baby, so it would have been about 13 years ago, Mike and I went with Greg and June to one of their events in California. So I know that the partnership, the kingdom partnership that SHV has is long enduring, and Mike and I have had long history with Convoy. And every time I hear Hal's story, I'm moved with the power of how his really awful, terrible circumstances led him not to remain in a bitter place or a desperate place, but to then help to lift others up and out of theirs. He bore their burdens. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Convoy, because I really, this is one of those organizations that... um, Year over year is one of the top star, the Navigator ratings and um, for charities. And they have four main initiatives, the disaster response. Now, if you're on our Facebook page, you saw this week we posted about Convoy's response in Haiti. If you're not, you can go check it out. Um, We've posted a video and some of the updates of what's happening on the ground. So Convoy will go in, they're staged around the world in different warehouses, and they're ready to respond in an instant. When Hurricane Katrina hit, they actually were so effective, they had government agencies coming to them saying, we can't even get our stuff on the ground. We don't know how you're doing it, but can we just give you our money to keep doing what you're doing? This is how effective they are. They're incredible. So not just domestically, but internationally, they respond to disasters. They have this incredible women's empowerment program where they will take women through a two-year program of training to understand how to... um, build a business, how to give them an idea, and the capital then, once they've graduated through the whole program, the capital, the seed money to start their business. Because they found that if you can change and eradicate poverty for a mother, not only will her family be radically changed, but then the moms begin to help the other moms. And they begin to say, let me show you what's happened with me. And they begin to seed into their community in ways that change entire faces of, of towns, of families. It's incredible. They have a doctor they call Dr. Dirt. Um, he heads up their agriculture program where they help to um, go into certain areas and develop agriculture that will be sustainable, that won't drain a a community's resources, but 10 years from now will actually be more fruitful than it is right then. And then the whole goal of that is get them started and leave. 
right? They celebrate every time they get to leave a community because it's been so successful. And their children's feeding program is amazing. So they, about three years ago, they hit 250,000 children every day that were being fed, which was a huge accomplishment. And just two weeks ago, we got an update on the numbers. 387,000 children are fed every day through Convoy. And what we love is they use the local church to do this. So they don't, they don't go to places that, um, you know, a lot of times where children will actually be sent to an orphanage because their families cannot afford to care for them. Not that they're not loved, not that they don't have a home, but that they can get fed and go to school. And so Convoy is now partnering with schools to say, we'll take care of all of the food so that the kids can stay with their family, but they'll get educated, they'll get the food they need, and they have these remarkable, um, Mike got to actually go to one of the schools in Haiti, uh, I think it was about 2012 he went, and the way that they track it, the way, I mean, it's just incredible. They measure every kid to make sure the food is going to them, and they know how much the kids should be growing, and it's incredible. This one question presented as a simple inquiry that we could just be quoting Galatians 6 to. How are you bearing the burdens of others? Changed his life and has changed countless lives. I think, oh yeah, we've got some stats, which is super helpful if you're interested. And you can go check out their website. It's uh, convoyofhope.org. And I just do want to highlight this real quick. This book is called um, Disruptive Compassion. And it's kind of the story of Convoy, um, written by Hal. If you're at all interested, this is a great book just to challenge you on, can I really make a difference? Because I don't know about you, but weeks like this week, where I look at the devastation in Haiti, and I look at what the, just the absolute atrocities that are happening in Afghanistan, my heart breaks, and I go, Lord, I, can, can we even do anything? And we can find solace knowing that because we partner with people like Convoy, that SHB and us personally and, and our alignment with them means we are on the ground in Haiti. But for some of us, there may be a little bit more. So I just wanted to mention that tonight, just in case you're looking for a, um, a really practical consideration of, God, what have you maybe called me to do? Because here's my question for you. We've spent the last two months kind of going through all these fantastic stories, right? The ways that the scripture has come alive, the people that we've seen that really represent faithfulness and gentleness and love and joy and kindness, peace, self-control. Those who bring those, the fruit of the Spirit in to um, bring gentle restoration in the family and, and challenge us maybe to go further beyond. Do you sometimes, though, feel like a passive participant in that? Like sometimes I'm like, oh, man, that's amazing. Well, that was a great sermon. See you next week. You know? Sometimes. I'm just going to be honest. N.T. Wright in his book on Galatians explains that in these particular verses, Paul is tackling this really interesting thing. He's painting a picture of the church of both this reality of the mutual and the individual responsibility that we have in the family of Christ. The focus, he says, that Paul may have been really keen in on is the importance of being, building a community without jealousy and without rivalry. Paul obviously knew how easily a sense of social and cultural competition could invade the church, producing a combination of pride and fault-finding. So who might the Lord be calling you to come alongside of, to carry a burden, to say this is part of what we do in the family of Christ. And sometimes that looks like us feeding our neighbors who have food insecurities, like what we've done forever with Hope Story. It's here, maybe it's with Convoy of Hope and us being able to say we will respond when people are in desperate places of need. We will say, yes, we are already there with them. Or maybe when we read a scripture like Galatians 6 in the beginning and you kind of go, boy, I, I feel that, that twinge in my heart about comparison. I feel something when, when we hear those words of living a life that is not one to be compared, but Lord, to, 
to consider that nothing compares to you and that our own journeys are ours. And Lord, that you have something powerful. So church, how do we balance this of being personally, individually responsible and family together that links arms and walks life out? Does anyone have any ideas? Because we want to be a family that does more than just gathers together, right? We're, Joan and Stephanie were talking about all of the small groups that we're kicking off in the fall. We want to be family that actually lives life together, that actually says, when I'm in a really desperate place, I can reach out and go, man, I am struggling. When I sound like Kermit the Frog and my dear friend brings me throat coat because <laughs> I'm able to reach out and go, hey guys, I, I'm like really struggling. Who says, do you want to go check out that school in Haiti with me? Do you want to go see what's happening in the, the orphanages in Calcutta? Do you want to go on and on and on? Do you want to say yes on someone's front lawn to whatever it is that the Lord's going to put in front of you? This isn't a message to make us feel guilty. This is, this is something to go, Lord, I want to be who you want me to be. Me. I'm not speaking for you. I wouldn't assume anybody else's place but mine. And what I do hope our church desires. I want us to be a church that says we are about each one of us in this room and the neighbors and the people in it, our workplace, at our schools, in our lives and our families that no one else is going to get a chance to reach. We want to be a church that says, I love with this church, this church that we're really blessed to get to partner with and do church service at. I want to bless what they're doing because what they're doing is great. Church is not competition. Did you know that? Did you guys know it's not the Olympics? Like I was thinking about like I, one time I ran the warrior dash. Have you, you know, it's like a 5k and you like put on whatever I put on a tutu and a crown and like I was looking back at some pictures I'm like that would be like comparing me to the Olympic athletes in my little tutu and my crown running the warrior dash with like the women who are like you know winning the gold and the silver and the bronze and church is not about competing like the scripture is really clear where it says that there are many parts of the body and they all they all serve their purpose, right? The, the big toe is not going to do the same thing as the finger, and it's not going to do the same thing as your mouth. And if we were all mouths, who would listen to us? Not very many people. We need the ears, right? So we're going to do communion together. And I want us to, to just, if you're willing, would you just ask the Lord this? Not for a dream maybe of 45 million people big. Maybe it's a dream for one person. Maybe it's for your neighbor or the family member that you maybe are like, please, Lord, don't let it be them. Or... Maybe the Lord's just going to bring up something of going, I just want you to be free of this comparison or something like that. I want us to consider that as Jesus himself laid down his own life and took on every single one of our burdens, how we can consider how to carry the burdens of others. Are you willing to just say, Lord, if you do something, I'll say yes. You don't even have to know what it is. You don't even have to have anything tonight. That's my challenge for you as we, as we remember how Jesus quite literally bore our burdens on the cross, gave himself for the salvation of all that we might be free, that we might have hope for the eternal, not just for the things of this world. Would you be willing to say, I think that's the question in front of you, just would you say yes if I, if I bring something to you? 
Those joining online, you don't have our fun little cups, so feel free to just grab juice and a cracker or bread and join us. You want to open the top first because if you don't, you're going to make a big mess. So just a little pro tip for you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. His body broken, him bearing the weight of our sin on the cross, broken on our behalf. Lord, we remember you. We remember your sacrifice and we say, Father, we desire to be the family of Christ that says yes. Lord, that will stand on the front lawn and say, we'll take them. Lord, whatever that is for each person. Will you take the bread with me? And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Father, today, tonight, as we gather together and we say, Lord, how would you have us be set free from sin, from comparison, from a focus on our own selves, Lord, as you desire to challenge us to bear one another's burden in the way that you perfectly witnessed for us. Lord, we do this in remembrance of you until the very day you return. Noel is going to close us in worship and the team. Thank you, guys. Let's stand together. I just want to real quick say, if, if you guys have, um, we're going to make ministry available. If you have anything at all that you, in the same ways maybe that you were grieved this week, that feels so burdensome, let us come and join you right now. Let us carry that burden today. You don't walk alone. And if you just feel the conviction, like maybe the Lord is saying, hey, go tell somebody that you're willing to say yes or go tell them what I said. We're here. Or maybe it has nothing to do with that. We would love to pray with you and be a part of this journey of faith. We can go ahead and have our prayer ministry team come up. These are folks who have been trained to pray with you be on both sides of the stage here if you'd like to come up and have someone pray um, with you and what you feel like God's saying. The, The two words that are coming to mind for us today are invitation and interruptible. And so I think that for many of us today, there is a particular invitation that we feel God saying. And maybe it's just that we'll be ready uh, to accept that invitation. But if that's something that you feel like God is um, asking you to commit to, it's always um, better to make commitments with other people so we have encouragement, so we have accountability, so we're not doing it alone. So if you know today is a day where you're ready to say yes to the invitation of God, maybe it's, again, like Christy said, something that you already um, have the specifics for, and maybe it's just being ready to say yes, I'd encourage you to, to say that out loud, to have someone pray with you, to have that courage in the moment to accept God's invitation. And alongside that is interruptible. Often the pace that we live our lives, we we don't make room for the Lord to interrupt us, to notice someone who um, God might be putting in our path for a reason. So that would be a, a wonderful thing to commit to tonight too, to be interruptible by Jesus. Feel free to come up for prayer for anything. Don't leave the same way you came. As children we come,
what is the Lord saying to you? And I feel like there's actually some students in the room and maybe watching online that this particular message is for you, that there are going to be other um, students around you that are going to need someone to notice them and to help carry the burdens that they uh, might be carrying this year, particularly someone who's willing to enter into their story, to care about them when maybe no one else seems to. So if you are a student and you want to have that heart of compassion, you want to have eyes to see maybe people that aren't inside your circle at the moment, but, um, but God wants to bring, um, I'd encourage you to get prayer too. It takes courage um, to notice other people and it takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there. So our prayer team would love to pray with you too. And oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is close our service uh, today I'd encourage you to hold out your hands um, open hands are just a, a sign that we're ready to receive good gifts from a God who loves us very much I'd love to pray a blessing over you I bless you to be people who do not live life alone but who join in the community of the Trinity Father Son and Spirit who choose not to be alone who choose to be with each other and with us I choose you, uh, bless you to be men and women and young adults and children who know the deep love of God and who carry that with you in such a way that it's ready to spill out to a world that is in need and that is looking for rescue. I bless you to be people who have compassion beyond your own making, that the Lord would break your hearts for what breaks his and that you would be moved to action towards justice, towards kindness, towards humility. And I bless us to be a people who carry each other's burdens, who are interruptible, and who accept the invitation of Jesus day in and day out. Go in the name of the good Father and the perfect Son, the present and powerful Holy Spirit. Have a great week. Hey guys, Mike and Christy Colley here. We're the lead pastors at SHV, and we wanted to personally invite you to join us in person on Saturday nights for service at 5 p.m., worship and community. You know, there's a special thing about actually being with other people yeah. in the room and learning what life with God looks like. And the SHV community is full of incredible people from different backgrounds, and we're all learning how to follow Jesus together. Yeah, so whatever your story, whatever your history, 
Whatever your dreams for the future, you have a place at the table here at SHV. Yeah, and we would love to get the chance to know you better. And not just we in a, in a large sense, but for Christy and I, we would love to get to know you. So if you are around on a Saturday and it's your first time in person, please come say hello to us. We'd love to have a chance to meet you. Yeah, and remember, you are not alone. Mm. We are all better together. And we hope to see you soon on Saturday nights. Yeah, God bless. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you soon on a Saturday.